29 seconds Mama. of pleading Please need my dick. and pain I'm through. until his last breath. Don't kill me, man. <laughs> Igniting a renewed movement here in Kansas City. What's his name? Tired. We're all tired. We just want justice. That's all we're asking for. No lives matter. No black lives matter. No lives matter. No black lives matter. I want this to be peaceful and I want it to be successful. But more importantly, voices need to be heard. Freedom is for everyone. The call for justice for George Floyd continues today as protesters return to the streets here in Kansas City. Hopefully, if we make enough noise, it'll make a difference. Why do we want justice? You can't just ignore it. It's happening and you hear it. Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Black lives matter! George Floyd died on May 25th, 2020, Memorial Day. Just days later, this was Kansas City. I'm tired of seeing black bodies on the ground as a result of the police. The situation is not okay. You cannot keep killing us. You cannot keep harming us. You cannot keep trying to silence us. And so that's what we're out here for. I was out there too, watching listening and reporting live during the protests. The crowd will swell, we'll get some volume, some chants, and then it'll go back down. One of the things that struck me was the diversity of the crowd, how many young people I saw. A lot of people we talked to said, we just want them to hear us. People raised their concerns, their voices, and their fists demanding change. I'm looking around at this sea of all different flavors out here right now that have become appalled at this injustice. We, as African Americans, have endured for so long. A year later, we went to the people who spent those summer days in the streets. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. I was worried about getting back in that space again. What space? Of just the pain, of the hurt, of the thinking about my son. My mother would always say, one of the first words you ever, she ever heard me say was, you know, freedom now, freedom now. So to have to be, to, you know, to come back around to that as a 59-year-old woman still in the streets going freedom now, freedom now, because of the same things that were happening then are still happening now, you wonder, but you have to do it. You have to do it. Black Lives Matter! We marched in South Kansas City, we marched in Brookside, we marched in Prairie Village. I saw people coming out of their homes in Prairie Village cheering as we're walking down the streets. You know, Olathe, Overland Park. It was like, it wasn't just a moment, it was like a movement. But peaceful conversations changed to canisters of tear gas after some people in the crowd violently assaulted police with whatever was available. During the first few days, 20 officers were injured by objects thrown at them, one hospitalized for a head injury, and another hospitalized with a lacerated liver. People are backing up, here comes the gas. Here comes the, t they are pelting the officers with water bottles right now. This is not live ammunition that you're hearing popping on your screens right now. Days of peaceful demonstration devolved into destruction. But it's been a very, very tense scene here outside the plaza. Vandalism, fires, frustration. Then, the dawn of a new day. We need you to be allies. Listen to us. We are not dangerous, we are passionate. The pastors started preaching. How do we hold ourselves accountable one to another? A year later, I locked eyes with some of the same faith leaders who felt called to respond and asked what led them there. It is this yearning for the greater good of community. Ron Lindsay, Randy Feakey, and Adam so, Hamilton lead congregations in South Kansas jobs. City and Leewood. Where does your faith inform your activism. I think they're one and the same. I want to thank everyone for showing up today. Leading him to the front lines of the protests, bullhorn in hand. I can pray all day long, but unless I respond to the answers that I get in prayer, nothing will change. So let's lay you in a box, please. Dozens of pastors showed up in the early days of the protest. Trying to speak truth to power, trying to speak up for justice, and at the same time, still being concerned for every person who's around there, which is, I think, what the prayer was for the police officers beforehand. When you hear Black Lives Matter, what does it mean? That we are absolutely relevant. You'll hear white folks who will sometimes say, well, all lives matter. We need to say all lives matter. And a part of what I've shared with our congregation is we have to say Black Lives Matter because it's not self-evident in our nation's history that Black Lives Matter. 
It's, it's pretty implicit that white lives matter in America. And what isn't implicit is that black lives matter. And that's why it has to be said. One moment marked the protests here in Kansas City. If you ain't got the to protect the streets and protect and serve like you were paid to do, turn to your damn back. Local activist Terrence Maddox walked me through his account of what happened with police. They sprayed my daughter first at point blank range with a K-9 fogger. And then they sprayed me and just kind of pulled me out into the street uh, with, with full force. When you saw the video of what happened to your dad, what do you feel? I just felt like that was unfair. Like, like the whole point is to get the situations and the killings to stop. And y'all just arresting him for nothing. That just escalates more problems. In March, a Jackson County grand jury indicted KCPD officer Nicholas McQuillan, who's now charged with fourth degree assault for the incident. What does justice look like to you for your daughter? Justice looks like to me a simple apology. Brad Lemon, president of the Fraternal Order of Police, released a statement that reads in part, Officer McQuillan employed the lowest level of force available to him, later adding that the individual here had no injuries or lasting effects from the use of the spray. I couldn't believe that he would say that, you know, he has daughters himself. At some point, the father has to come out of him, the real man has to come out of him and say, hey, you were just out of line. But why would you be nice? Instead of him trying to lie in his statement on me about me trying to resist an arrest or something like that, but yeah. Were you arrested? No. Maybe the first thing I hear. There were others. Sean Cerns was blinded by a projectile. Elise Villarreal was also injured by Kansas City police officers at the protests. Even though they weren't aiming for me, they hit me, broke my finger in two places. I wanted to bring in Kansas City Police Chief Rick Smith to ask about everything that happened here and address things like use of force, accountability, and community trust. Despite my best efforts and more than two months notice, he declined. Thankfully, a KCPD major and a captain did decide to come down and sit with me face to face and give me some perspective beyond some of the images we captured of police at the protests. What stood out to you from those moments? I would say uh, the emotion, just the tenacity of the protesters like, no, we, we won't change. We demand change. Last year, our cameras captured Captain Jeffrey Hughley. I decided, you know what, I'll go over and talk to him. Be like, hey, just to, it didn't explain the why, right? Like, hey, we don't have a totally secure. So this is why we ask you just to kind of not be in the street. This wasn't the only interaction he had at the protests. Who do I call? Do I call the police? So do I call 911 and say, I'm seeing a murder happen right now. I need your help. You got a Who's... cell phone? Do you have a cell phone? Yeah. That's your best witness right there. That's why we're here today, because there was another cell phone that captured an incident oh, that should have never oh, happened. What is the feeling for you when you see some of the videos that a lot of these young people are seeing? I would say that, so, it's kind of what we're all taught as a child very young. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. And whatever side that you're on or the profession doesn't excuse that. This uniform, or kind of commonly referred to as that blue wall, you know, it's, I see everything and it's black or white, you know? It's not, not much gray area or blue area. It's either right or wrong. But sometimes there is gray, a lot of it. Take this image of Major Joel Lovelady. We were getting rocks and bottles and a can of beans uh, thrown at us, um, you know, various objects. And uh, I believe they had already burned out a vehicle or two. Um, and the assembly had been called unlawful and they'd been given orders to disperse and directions where to. Um, and we had deployed gas. Uh, that was a long day. This was, for Kansas City, one of the first times that we were the target of the frustration. Some felt that frustration was misplaced. I've heard young men talk about the fact that they want their city back, that they know that there needs to be change, but to give it time. We saw rallies for police throughout the metro. One officer's wife painting a different picture of this moment. I want to show support for um, an industry and a profession that is, in my opinion, not getting the credit or respect that's due. The divide in our country captured in countless images of officers up close and personal with the protesters. How do you hear their message and say, okay, they want to see some change with how we do our jobs, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a personal beef with me. I'm very, I'm very culture focused, right? So like, I always defend the why, but not, not the what. It's like, oh, well, they pulled him over or they arrested him or they took him to jail or they had to use force is what they did. Let's get back and refocused on, okay, why they did this or why do we do what we do or why does the community need us? As the protests continued, KCPD altered its approach. We kind of disengaged. We're like, you know, if we don't have to be there, let's not be there. Did you feel like backing up a little bit helped? I think at times, absolutely it did help. If you could tell the people who were out here protesting, calling for change, one thing, what would it be? We hear you. We, we are definitely here for you. Um, you have more allies than you think you have. I can't say that I necessarily understand um, being an Irish male or a Caucasian male. I can be empathetic. Um, I can seek to understand it. Um, I can listen. Let me ask the follow-up. Okay. Are you there for them? Absolutely. Um, we're there um, before the incidents of last summer. We're there now. have been thrown at many of the officers right now. As a result, there have been about a half dozen arrests. One of the conversations I witnessed was someone screaming with passion, stop killing us. Very tense. Emotions are running very high, the highest that they have been. Several police officers made their way here right now as they march forward kind of with their shields in tow. My co-anchor Kevin Holmes covered the protests in the early days, live from the plaza, pointing our community toward the true heart behind the heartache. Our TV station is about three blocks away, so I walked over here on my dinner break. When you get here, what do you see? What do you notice? I notice uh, a melting pot of people. Walk me through your feelings when you first saw the George Floyd video. Disgust. Strong word. Pain. Anger. Um, it's even tough to talk about. I mean, it's more than a year later, and it's tough to talk about just watching it, both as a journalist and as a viewer, and as a black man, um, to have to to, to, to watch them through those three prisms can be exhausting, man. But for me, it wasn't what it looked like, Kevin. It was what it sounded like. Mama! When George Floyd called for his mama, every mother knows what that sounds like. And I think for me, that has never left me. Neither has this interview from our coverage with a woman named Missy. As a black woman, do the struggles, do does the message hit home a little more poignantly for you? I have a 17-year-old son, it absolutely does, because I'm out here for him. Looking back, we learned some things. It forced us to look in the mirror as journalists to see how we're dealing with that word empathy. Um, and, you know, there have been many times where we haven't. Calls for change are also challenging us to be more accountable to our community, too. A lot of times people say, well, y'all focus more on damage to a building than the loss of a life. What do you say to those people? As we look on the plaza now, there were some places that were on fire. There were some places that were boarded up. They're fine today. George Floyd isn't here. This is horrible, and I just decided to help. So here I am, because this is my city, and this is ridiculous. We had one um, of our large front windows that was damaged. So we returned to RE store. The owner, Chrysalyn Huff, opened her doors for a conversation between local business owners from the Country Club Plaza with Keith Bradley from Made in KC and Chase McAnulty from Charlie Hustle. I'm gonna get emotional. It was really emotional for us. It was really emotional for me. Why is it so emotional for you? Because I, I don't know, because I don't, don't care about my windows. That one moment was a, just another breaking point. For the first time, maybe white people felt that breaking in a way that we had never felt before. I don't think that's a bad thing. No, I mean, to add to that, the windows were, anything that happened to the store uh, was inconsequential to what was going on. Um, like Chrissy said, nothing really mattered uh, other than, um, you know, seeing the bigger picture. Keith, I want to come to you. We actually came to your store because you boarded up, but the front of Made in KC was plastered 
with signs in support of the protesters. We wanted, again, to, to, to lend support to something that was going on that was much larger than our business, uh, even much larger than our city. We participated in Blackout Tuesday early on, closed all of our stores to allow our team uh, a day off to reflect on everything that had happened. We started working on a, a, a Black Lives Matters collection. The proceeds benefited the Prospect Business Association. Plus, we built a a campaign called 1K for KC. We helped over 130 families pay rent, pulled eight of them out of uh, eviction and two of them out of foreclosure. RE made a donation to the Truist Collective and hosted a special event at the store. Was that healing for you in any way? I think so. Um, it was natural for us to reach out to the Truist Collective because they are a group of people who um, they work with makers and artists, which is something, that's how we started our business. The hardest thing that you learned over the last year from the protest till now, and the most beautiful thing you've learned? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the hardest thing I learned was, was probably what white privilege is. It's not that white people don't struggle, but uh, we don't have that obstacle of the color of our skin. Realizing that Kansas City still has a long way to go, that as many great things we have about our city, uh, when it comes to uh, um, racial inequality, that is one of the, the biggest areas of growth we have to, in our city to overcome. And it's easy to forget that sometimes, uh, it, it shouldn't be, uh, but I think the, the protest brought that to light. It's not just Kansas City. Black 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 Black. Protests after the death of George Floyd popped up all over the country and the world. High school students in a little Kansas town made a big statement. It just made me really angry and I just wanted to speak up and have my voice heard. They came up to me and they were like, you know, we want to protest. We want you to come, we want you to speak. And I'm just, first of all, I'm just impressed that they want to even do something. Like you were alluding to, Cottonville's not somewhere where you think there would be like a social justice movement. Justin Cartwright is a teacher at Coffeeville High School. <laughs> my dad is from Coffeeville. His whole family is from here. So my three aunts grew up here. Uh, my grandfather was an educator here. People who are old enough to remember him still know him. So me teaching here is like a full circle coming home type of moment. When his kids came to him for guidance on getting a protest organized, he was incredibly proud. It was like a positive burst of energy for the town. Like that was really cool. And the kids all did it. It's like, <laughs> there's so many people there and I was just happy that everybody could come together. That's a story they could tell generations. Like that's really exciting. Even in the face of oppression. Activist and attorney Stacy Shaw was a prominent voice during the protests in Kansas City. What did you hear? <sighs> um, a lot of anger, um, but we started chanting. Don't shoot! Hands up, don't shoot! I started shouting, hands up, don't shoot. They're going to be reminded of our rightful outrage. People feel like you sanction threats on police officers. Absolutely not. The only thing that I said is that we need to make sure that their family, and I did say including their children, everyone needs to know if they are living with a monster. Shaw is part of a coalition in Kansas City that camped out at City Hall, calling for KCPD Chief Rick Smith to be fired and to decrease funding for the department. In our conversation, she told me why. No matter how much you get the community involved, it's not a community problem. It's a police problem. The police need to fix themselves. But when we talk about real solutions, real um, mental health treatment, real drug abuse treatment, why don't we fund our schools? Why don't we fund safe housing? Why don't we fund neighborhoods? Why don't we fund increased job training? The Vols KC came together as a group and decided to do this action today. Manny Abarca is with Vos KC. I remember us all getting together and taking a picture, and it was at that moment that we all walked away and were like, yeah, this is 
we need to be present for not only this movement, but for many movements in the future. Vos means voices. The Latinx group of activists are using theirs to center the Black Lives Matter movement here in Kansas City. We share the same issues. We, we live in the same neighborhoods. Um, we, we grow together. And the reality that if this could happen to George Floyd, it could happen to any one of us. Several images from the plaza protests include this sign. It says, tu lucha es mi lucha. The sign's in Spanish. Yeah. Why? I think it just, it, it connects the issues, right? If we want to change use of force protocol, right, to make sure that we're not actually seeing somebody die, seeing somebody get killed under an officer's knee, right? That's the sort of measurable I want. Often it has been criminalized just to be black and existing in America. Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas says the protesters pushed the city forward. There's a whole bunch of stuff that has passed that would not have passed without their voices. Changes in how protests are treated, data reporting, what types of excessive force violations are happening. Changes in third party uh, investigation of shootings. Right, we have the highway patrol in investigating in every shooting. KCPD got body cameras. The city decriminalized marijuana, parking tickets, and jaywalking. But most people believe there's more work to do. Yeah, it feels incomplete. I think because we haven't been willing yet, uh, broadly enough, to have that conversation on, all right, what, what fundamentally needs to change? What is the message you take away from the protests? I think the message I take away um, I'm encouraged. We saw thousands of young people pouring out into the street, exercising their constitutional rights, demanding change. That, to me, means that there's a whole new horizon. It's about time. It's about time that Black Lives do matter. I would tell my friends, come join me. You know, it's not, the, 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 you know, sometimes what makes the news isn't exactly the most exciting thing. So come down and be a part of this and have these dialogues because you're going to learn something. After all, history is watching. What's his name? George Floyd. Which pieces are we tearing out? And are we willing to stand up and speak up when injustice shows up? We need a lot more of the listen to the pain people are experiencing and figuring out how do we solve these problems from here. And have conversation um, where hearts can be moved. Um, those that, That's what politicians that's what the law enforcement, that's what needs to, needs to happen. And, um, and then policies can, can change from that. How do we create a culture where there is that trust? Well, one, I think both sides want that. So you're at least headed in the right direction. It is a sign that their voices have mattered and that we need the advocate's voice. We need the community's voice. I have a picture of my youngest grandson who is standing holding hands with these two beautiful brown little girls. I hope that they will see themselves in 20 years and that they will be able to tell the story of how it used to be. If we can have any kind of part in um, making that a better place to live, we gotta do it. Your voice matters no matter where you're from. It was a powerful movement. It is a powerful movement um, that we'll continue to have conversations on for many years, I think. No justice, no peace. Protests here lasted for weeks. Thousands of people came to cry out with broken hearts, still hopeful that our community can rise from this. Looking back over the last year, what do you see? Are you listening yet? I'm Dia Wall. Sincere thanks to our partners at KCUR and the Kansas City Public Library. This was 929, the minutes that moved Kansas City.